Uh, we've got a special, special friend of this church for, uh, I'll, let, I'll, I'll let him tell you for how long. And when Gary said we've got an old friend here, he meant that it's, it's it, it, old and like going back so many years. That's what, he, that's, what he was, that's what he was referring to, right? As, as you will notice, uh, this man hasn't changed a bit. He still has the fire of God in him. I know that they refer to Charles Spurgeon as the Prince of Preachers, but he's long been gone. Uh, I really believe this. Uh, Brother Bolte, I've known him for all of those years and I've uh, gotten to know him uh, even better. Uh, and we've had some wonderful conversations these last few weeks. Brother Bolte, uh, I appreciate you. I honor you. I bless you. You are a man of God. And, uh, but uh, he's alive. And I truly mean this. This guy is a prince of preachers. And I know he's got a word from the Lord on his heart. And from out of the heart, his mouth is going to speak. And if you are uh, open and ready to receive, God's going to change your life this morning. You believe that? God's going to change something in your life this morning as you hear the Word of God. So with that, let's give him a warm Minnesota welcome, Brother Richard Bolte. Well, I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus. It is absolutely thrilling for me to be back. I... Uh, when we uh, booked this date, I got out my records and I discovered that I have been coming to this church since 2001. And that's Brother Benson's fault. <laughs> so if, you, if you're against that, you have to talk to him. And uh, he invited me to come up here all those years ago. And not only have I learned to love this church, I'll just say this publicly, uh, Ken Benson and his wife have become some of the most precious people in my life, and I started holding revivals when I was 18 years old, and, so, and that's a long time ago. And I am telling you, they are just precious. And we had a time of fellowship last night that was just absolutely wonderful, and I, I want to just make sure that I honor him and Sister Benson, they're just wonderful people. And your pastor, uh, like he said, we've known one another starting back in 2001. And uh, just bless him. He's a good man, honest man. A man that loves the Lord with all of his heart. And I am just convinced that uh, he is a man that is hungry to fulfill God's purpose in his life. Uh, I got to just say some things before I begin, uh, if, you, if you'll allow me. Uh, you know, when you get a chance to travel, uh, sometimes you do some things. I've never driven up here. Uh, I now live in Franklin, Tennessee. And uh, so uh, I thought, well, you know what? You're hearing all this stuff about layovers and troubles, changing planes and whatever. So I said, I'm just going to drive. And so I did. And I drove up here. It's a wonderful drive. About from my house is a, close to 900 miles. And you know one thing I have discovered? <clears throat> There's a lot of corn in Iowa. <laughs> I am telling you, you drive for miles and miles, and I couldn't even hardly find a farmhouse. It would just corn, 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 more corn. So it was, it was, it's been a good trip, and I got a chance to get up here, and as I mentioned, we went out last night and, and just had a great time of fellowship with Pastor Gary and his wife, and Pastor Kurt and his wife, and the Bensons. It was just a wonderful time. And you have to know that my daughters check up on me. So this morning, the first thing, the phone starts ringing, my phone starts ringing. Daddy, how did things go last night? Daddy, I, I say, hey, it was great. You know, they, they check up on. Most of you, I don't know if you know or not, but my wife passed away four years ago. And uh, since Sandra has been gone, the girls have taken over as far as checking on dad. Dad, did you eat? I said, well, take a look at this stomach. You, 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 you think I've eaten? You, you, you know. Dad, are you doing this? Dad, are you doing that? Oh, man. But anyway, I'm a blessed man. God is so good to us, is he not? 
I've been asking the Lord, oh, I want to have something to say to you, to the house, to the people that's watching. Uh, I want you to turn with me to the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, there are some folks that don't think Ecclesiastes is a very spiritual book. Uh, but I want to tell you, there's some things in Ecclesiastes that we might need to take a look at. And Ecclesiastes chapter 3 I want to uh, read something that's very familiar. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, starting in verse 1. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Now that word time there is actually talking about a, a, a section of time, a period of time. Might be long, might be a little bit longer. It, it, it's just an area of our life. And then it goes on and says this. There's a time to be born, a time to die. Time to plant, time to pluck up what it's planted. Time to kill, time to heal. Time to break down, time to build up. Time to weep, time to laugh. Time to mourn, a time to dance. And it goes on and on and on. Telling us about ups and downs. Ups and downs. You know, that's sort of a pretty good commentary on life. In fact, if I was going to choose a title for this uh, message, I'd be talking about how to live in a bipolar world. <laughs> because that's life. Ups, downs. The only thing I'm really sure about is... Life is constantly changing. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. And is that not what the man said here in Ecclesiastes? Sometimes you laugh, sometimes you dance, sometimes you cry, sometimes you mourn. That's life. And I think that most of us are experiencing that every way it is. I don't care how old you are, it's not just old. In fact, someone told me one time that our life, a psychologist said that our life can actually be like the seasons of the year. It's like spring. It's like summer. It's like fall, like winter. The springtime of our life is that youthful life, full of excitement, full of preparation. Now, we got some here. We have some youth here today. Years ago, I was part of that group. A long time ago. But even though you might be in the springtime of your life, there's constant ups and downs. You might be in the summer of your life. That, that time of excitement, that time of energy, when everything is just, oh, it's wonderful to feel the sun. You know, it's just great. You might be there. Some's there. Some's in the fall of your life. That's the maturity of your life. It's a time when you actually can be the most productive because you've learned some things from the spring and the summer. And so when you get in the fall, you're a little bit smarter, hopefully, uh, just by trial and error, if nothing else. And then you come to winter, and that's where some of us are at. We're in the last portion of our life, of our existence on this planet. Those are the advanced years. But one thing I do know that no matter what part of that, those seasons you're in, there's going to be change. There's always going to be ups. There's always going to be downs. And some of these things uh, happen when you're not expecting them. I don't tell you, it just catches you off guard. Now, I don't want to make anybody sad, not trying to make you sad, but I want to tell you something. To use this as an illustration, in uh, October of 2017, uh, Sandra and I, our first great-grandchild was born. Now, can I tell you about the excitement? And if you ever can remember my preaching, I talk about my family a lot. We were, we're a blessed family. We had, Sandra and I had two daughters, and 
And then those two daughters gave us four grandchildren. And oh my goodness, in October of 2017, old Brock was born. I cannot tell you about how Sandra and I felt. Our first great-grandchild. It's hard to explain. Marvelous time. Now remember, that was October of 2017. We're way up here. I can't tell you how high we were. And then I noticed that Sandra was losing weight. And I said, Sandra, something's wrong, babe. You need, we need to get you, to get you a good checkup. So we got her to the doctor, and they drew blood and called us for a meeting. And they discovered that Sandra had leukemia. And then they sent us to a specialist at Vanderbilt Hospital there in Nashville. We met with this guy, and he's the, rec he's the most recognized guy in the United States on leukemia. And uh, we met with him. He uh, did more tests, called us back, and said, I've only ever seen five cases of this. And all the cases of leukemia I've discovered and worked with over the years. It's very, very rare. And uh, all of a sudden, we're no longer up here. In October of 2017, we as high as a kite. In December of 2017, just a couple months away. Oh, by the way, on our 54th wedding anniversary, we got the diagnosis that this was very, very serious stuff. And uh, he said, their only hope is a, uh, a bone marrow transplant, but they had to try to get her blood, cor uh, blood corpuscles in line before they could even think about that. They couldn't do it. I'm just telling you this. Up, about the time we got a, up a hope, he said, you know, we, we can give her, a, a, you know, a bone marrow transplant. And this, well, then we found out she couldn't do it, just couldn't do it. So we're back down again, you know. And there were times during this period from 2017 on our anniversary, he said to us, there's a good chance she's got six months. I can't tell you how fast things went down. Up, down. Now, I'm not trying to make anybody feel sorry for me. I'm just telling you, that's life. Oh, man, somebody here needs to hear this today. Up, down. I don't know what, when it's going to happen in your life, and I'm not a gloom and doom guy, but I'm telling you, life changes and sometimes it changes very dramatically and my wife in six months she was gone in June of 2018 okay now here's what I want to talk about today when these changes come and some of them just catch us off guard and we're not prepared for them uh, we, we've tried to quote our scriptures we tried to sing all of our praise songs We've tried to do all the right things. We've tried to live by scripture. We've tried to be obedient to God. And you're scratching your head and you're saying, what's going on? Here's my question. When you're having these bipolar experiences, what do you do with them? How do you handle them? What comes out of you? Fear? Sometimes it does. Sometimes it does. You say, well, bless God, brother, if you got the Holy Ghost, you ain't going to be afraid. I want to be delicate here. You're an idiot. Uh, that's about all I got to say on that subject right there. That's about it. Fear is a human emotion. 
And I don't care if you talk in tongues till your tongue gets tied in a knot. Your humanity is still there. And when you get a bad report, my guess is fear's going to get you. When something happens that catches you off guard, fear's going to be there. Doesn't mean you've lost your faith. Doesn't mean you don't believe in God. It just means you're a human. And we got to find out what we're going to do in these bipolar moments. So we're going to handle it with fear, maybe just frustration. We just can't make, can't get our minds clear. We just, we can't think straight. Or maybe we go to fury. We might just get flat out mad over the situation. Oh, you say, Brother Boldy, Christians don't do that. Yeah, they do. I was a Christian. I didn't lose my salvation through this thing with my wife. But I tell you one thing, I did experience some fear. I did experience some frustration. I did uh, have some times of anger. Why? I'm going to tell you why. Because I'd see somebody in, in Franklin, Tennessee that had the devil in them as big as an elephant and they're as healthy as a horse. And then there's my wife that I've lived with for 54 years. And brother, she's a wonderful woman, a wonderful wife, a wonderful mother, a wonderful grandmother. I mean, she's, she was good. She was a good one. And then I see some old woman over here that looks like death warmed over and, and she just, you know, has no concept of God, has no interest in the things of God. Then I see my wife. Yeah, got a little frustration at times. But here's what you've got to understand. We as believers have a secret thing, a weapon. It's called faith. And that's what you've got to fall back on. Amen. You fall back on your faith and you drive down a stake and you say, this is it. I will not move. I will not let fear overwhelm me. I will not let frustration rule me. I'm not going to let anger change my attitude. I'm going to stand on God and on his goodness. And I'm just building some faith right there. And you build up your faith. And I won't have time to, I I don't want to just talk about myself, but I want to tell you something, friend, that will give you a stabilizing force during these times of this bipolar experience, you'll, you can have some stability. Oh, yes, you can. You can have something that will not just knock you back and forth. You can be stable during this time. And you know what that stabilizing force is? It's God. Amen. God, i got to have something that doesn't change. Everything else in my life changes. Everything else goes, gets older, and it's just a mess at times. But, oh, if I can find this God who made a great declaration. He said, Behold, I am the Lord, and I change not. Everything else changes, but he doesn't change. His love is the same. His mercy is the same. His goodness is the same. Even when there's sickness in my house, there's goodness of God in my house. Amen. Amen. I didn't lose the favor of God. Had to cancel all my meetings. Wanted to stay with Sandra all the time. There were times that... uh, The Lord would visit us in such a way. You say, well, Brother Bowley, did you and y'all just sit around at nighttime and cry? Nope. You know what we did? I'm talking about your faith now. Here's a good way to do it. You rehearse the faithfulness of God in your life. And Sandra and I would sit in our condominium at nighttime. And we would just sit there and talk about the things that God had done for us in our married life how the, he had performed literal miracles in our life. And some of you might remember my testimony. And, and the rest of you that don't know my testimony, you don't need to know it. Uh, you, you'd end up saying, dear Lord, why did Pastor Kurt invite that guy back? You know, 
but I know what it is for God to perform miracles. And, and we would just rehearse these miracles and rehearse these miracles. And, and, and there would be times that the Lord would be so real in our living room that I remember on two different occasions, the Spirit of the Lord came on Sandra and she just started singing in tongues. And she just started singing in the Spirit. And the Lord was so real, and and I thought, whoa, she's healed. I, I mean, that's it. <laughs> oh, come on, you know we're we're grasping at things here. I said, that's God, man. Anybody can sing in the spirit, and it sounds that beautiful. Oh, the Lord's there, healing's taking place. Well, it didn't. A few months later, she was at her keyboard. She was a very good pianist. And she would be back there at her keyboard and she'd, as long as she could, she'd be playing worship music back there. And she'd be playing worship music. And uh, I went back there where the keyboard was at and uh, it happened again. The Spirit of the Lord came on her. Man, she started, kept playing. She started singing in the Spirit. And here I am again. <laughs> That's it. That's an upper. Hello. It's an upper. We feel God. Felt his presence. It was wonderful. I was convinced that healing was being manifested right then. You know what? It wasn't. Are you following me today? I'm talking to you about the real world. And we in the church world need to understand. There are times of spiritual highs. And oh, do we not love them. And are there times when there's low times? But I've got to make up my mind, am I going to be a man of faith? And the best way to do it is to rehearse the faithfulness of God. God has always been my God. God is my God. God is my God. He is my God now. I've made these confessions of faith and I will not let go of it. Amen? All right. So I just jotted down, I believe the Lord gave me some things to share with you about having a stability during these times. And here's some things that I feel like. Here's one thing you've got to do. You've got to cultivate faith and trust to accept whatever God allows to come into your life. I'm going to say that again. You must cultivate a faith and a trust to accept whatever God allows to come into your life. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. Sometimes it's ugly. Amen? Anybody? Can you say amen? Amen. Ah, That's the way it is, friend. That's just a real world. But one thing I do know, I can cultivate my faith and my trust to where when these times happen that's up and down and unstable, I can stand secure and I can be stabilized in the things of God. Now, that's not going to happen overnight. Now, I'm not a farmer. Don't know anything. I've never grown anything in my life. But I know one thing. Those fields of corn that I saw in Iowa, I'm not sure that I could stand flat-footed and touch the top of some of those corn stalks. They were were just gorgeous things. And and I thought, that didn't get there automatically. You know, some old farmer didn't get up and say, in Jesus' name, let there be corn. (laughs) It didn't happen. Somebody had to go out there and plow. Somebody had to break up the soil. Somebody had to sow some seed. Somebody had to pray for some rain. I mean, there was a waiting process before those big ears of corn showed up. And I, before I have something really become stable in my life, I've got to learn how to cultivate this thing. Learn how to live by faith. Learn how to trust him. Amen? You trust him? I trust this God. I I just refuse to give up on that. I trust this God. Here's the next thing I believe the Lord taught me. 
You've got to pursue a lifestyle that's focused on God and His purpose for your life. Now remember, we're going through a bad time. So what do I do? Where's Jesus? I'll tell you where he's at. Same place he's always been. Same place. He hadn't moved. He hadn't moved. So what I've got to do is to pursue a lifestyle that will focus upon God and his purpose for my life. Uh, There's no other way to do that, I don't think, except through the word of the Lord and prayer. Now, there might be some other ways to do that. But there's just, I, I know that's got to be part of it. I've got to pray and I have to focus on God. I've got to. Because I've got to believe that he still has a purpose for me. I have still had to be concerned about my lifestyle. I can't just get discouraged and say, well, I'll just quit this thing. No, no. I've got to be concerned about my lifestyle and pursue what God has in mind for my life. Amen. Now, is that, did anybody hear me say that's easy? It's not. When you're down and things aren't looking so good, it's not fun to pray. It's not easy to pray. Don't you love those times when, when you really do sense a liberty in prayer? Oh, it's wonderful. But I remember, brother, during those months with Sandra, I had a hard time praying. Brother Gary, there were times that all I could do is just repeat the Lord's Prayer. You say, well, I wish we had somebody here that had some faith. Well, I do too. But, I, but I'm just not, I don't claim to be a great man of faith, but I did find this out. I can pray the Lord's Prayer and say, Lord, I, you said when you, when you pray, pray like this. And I'd say, Lord, this is all I got. You know what I did? My girls found a book of prayers that was written by people, old saints, that's been dead at least 100 years old. They've been dead at least 100 years, and they're written down some of their prayers. I use those. You say, well, that's plagiarism. Could be. I don't know. I don't know if that's a, a spiritual plagiarism or what. But, Pastor, I couldn't pray. I couldn't get my thoughts together. But I knew I was supposed to be pursuing God. And I would read somebody else's sermons and somebody else's prayers on how to pursue God and seek Him. What do you want me to do? Why? I cannot let this time when things are down cause me to forget about pursuing God. I have to pursue him. Okay? Here's the next thing I believe the Lord, the Lord taught me. Develop a spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving. Now, if you are not a person of thanksgiving, you need to be. It's very easy to gripe, especially when things aren't going well. You know, very easy to find something negative. And uh, I'll never forget, the Lord taught me this a long, long time ago. A portion, part, a portion in our life, there was an area in our life, when uh, I'd been out of the ministry and uh, I'd renewed my covenant to God. Sandra renewed her covenant. And, 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 and we, we were ready to just serve the Lord. And I tell you how good, because those years that I was out of the ministry, I'd, I'd been in business and and uh, how, uh, this is how good God was. Right after we renewed our covenant, he let us go broke. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Lost my house, lost my business. Sandra wrecked my Lincoln town car. I had to sell her little sports car. We moved into an apartment with two teenage girls. Now, when I'm telling you, well, I'm telling you broke, I'm talking to you broke. And we started to, uh, uh, attending this church, and uh, it, was, it was this bad. 
they had a good youth group, and that youth group would always go out on Sunday night service for pizza. And I'd tell my girls, don't ask to go out. I didn't have five extra lousy dollars to give my girls to go eat pizza after church on Sunday night. It was tight. Man, but we would renewed our covenant to God. I'm trying everything I know to do to walk by faith. This is back in 1981. And uh, this is when the, when the confession movement was really strong. And, and uh, I'd listen to some of these guys preach, and, and they'd say, just call it in. Call it in from the north and the south and the east and the west. Just call it in. So I got out one night in the apartment complex. I went at night. I was afraid to do it in the daytime. I, so I got out in the parking lot at the apartment complex, and I looked to the north, and I said, give it up. Give it up. Didn't help. Nothing came in. Oh, then I heard this other preacher preach and said, tell your checkbook it's a liar. (laughs) So I got out my checkbook and I said, you lying devil. (laughs) I'm not broke. I'm rich. I'm rich. That didn't help either. I was driving an old station wagon that had 185,000 miles on it and the speedometer was broke. So I don't know. And that's what I was out working in. I'd gone into the insurance business and and I didn't mind selling, didn't mind working, but I I, I just, it was hard to try to catch up, you know. And uh, so I was on, we was living in Mobile, Alabama at that time. And on this one particular day, I was on Airport Boulevard, which is like as busy a street as you can imagine in Mobile. And that car died on me. Yeah. Now, down in Mobile, they're not too, uh, you know, they're not trained like you folks up here in Minnesota. You guys are so kind and Nobody honks at you, and everybody's nice. And, but uh, I am telling you, did anybody try to help me get that car over to the side? And it had to be 110 degrees if it was a degree. It was mercifully just horribly hot, and, and uh, humidity was hot. And I finally got that car over to the side of the road. And these people, did anybody help? No, they was honking. And some of them was giving me signs that, it was not really good signs. And, and uh, anyway, I finally got out the side of the road and I got in that car and I slammed the door and I said, when are you going to do something? And I heard something say to me, when are you going to be thankful for what I've already done? You should be in jail, but you're not. Shouldn't have your wife, but you do. You shouldn't have those girls, but you got them. You got clothes. You got food in the house. Yeah. And I sat on that side of that road, and I repented before God. And I wept, and I said, the longest day I live, help me be a man of thanksgiving. If I live in an apartment for the rest of my life, let me be a man of thanksgiving. And that's been a long time ago, but by the help and the grace of God, you're not going to hear too much complaining come out of my mouth because God taught me something that day. When it's a downtime, it's time to give thanksgiving. It's time to praise. Amen? One thing I always remember about this church here is you guys don't know a sad song. I mean, you don't. I mean, every song that I've ever heard you all sing here are songs that lift me up, songs that tell me about the greatness of the Lord, tell me about what the Lord has done. I mean, those are the things that you've got to go to. Man, if, if all you do is listen to old Southern gospel things that talk about, well, cross and chilly Jordan, one of these days, oh my God, help me. You know, 
help me, help me, help me. That ain't going to help you at all. You know, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. <laughs> That's not going to do a whole lot for you. So you make yourself praise him. You make yourself raise your hands and give him thanksgiving. Amen. You don't wait till everything's on the up again. You do it when your heart's heavy. You give him the praise. Here's the next thing I found out. Ask God for patience that will allow him to work on you in order to complete his will in your life. He doesn't stop working on us just because we're going through a bad time. The enemy of your soul will say, God's done with you. You're in the winter time of your life. You're in the winter time. When Sandra passed four years ago, it crossed my mind. I thought, you know, maybe this is it. I'll just sit here in this condominium and wilt away. You know? Didn't want to preach, didn't feel like preaching. Took time off. And then something started saying, you're still alive. You've told people to pursue. Now are you going to pursue or are you not? And so I, I started calling. I'm, I'm not the bravest man in the world, so I started calling preachers that I'd been preaching for for years. I mentioned it the last night at the table. I called Brother George Dudley. He's passed on now. I've been preaching for Brother Dudley since 1986 and haven't missed a day, missed a year at his church since 1986. And uh, I called Brother Dudley because I knew if I'd go to his church and if I'd have an emotional breakdown while I was preaching, he'd cry with me. I mean, he'd, he'd just get up there and hug me and cry. And, and he'd say, we love Sister Sandy too. <laughs> you know, hey. It might not be much in church, but he's with me. I'm just trying to tell you is I had to make a move. God still has a purpose. No, I'm not an 18-year-old kid starting out preaching anymore. Now I'm in my 70s. Is he done? No. I'm still breathing. I'm still here. So what I've got to do is find out what God has in mind for me. And God, give me patience to find out what you're up to in my life because I'm believing in you. Believing in you. Here's the next thing. Desire an attitude that will meet with his approval. Right up here. I am convinced the most important thing in our life is our attitude. That's right. What kind of attitude you got? What's your outlook on life? You know, are you expecting something good? Or are you have an attitude of hope? Are you still looking for the Lord to do something with you, through you, for this church? You know, or have we gotten to the place of, well, we, I just feel a little discouraged. You know, I know there's nobody here at, at this church that's this way, but uh, <clears throat> when I pastored, I pastored in Mobile from 19... 88 to 1994 and uh, and I, I remember that uh, <laughs> I had this lady in my church that I'd miss her and so I'd call and I'd say hey everything all right well I'm just going through a trial and I'm just waiting because God said if I'd wait, he'd raise me up like an eagle. And if she did come out to church, she'd just sit like a knot. She, <laughs> she wouldn't move. She, just, she wouldn't sing. She'd just sit back there and look sad, just look pitiful. And, uh, and if you'd say something to her, she'd say, well, I'm going through a trial. And I'm just waiting the Lord said, if I'd wait, I'd raise up like an eagle. 
Dear God, you have studied, you have studied that, 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 that scripture, haven't you? The whole thing, it said, they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up on wings as eagles. At mounting, that's an active word. They're doing something. They'll run. They'll not be weary. They'll walk. No feet. That's action. That's action. So if, if all we're doing is being inactive, not much is ever going to happen for us. We're going to stay down for a while. So we've got to make sure that we just have this attitude that says, I'm going to meet with his approval, and his approval is that I serve him. Period. That's it. Now, how do I serve him? Here's what the Bible said. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his gates with, into his courts with, yeah. That's how I'm supposed to do it. That's my attitude. I'm going to be a person that I'm going to lift him up. I'm going to bless his name. I'm going to serve him with gladness. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I'm going to handle this time of being down. I'm not going to let it keep me down. I'm going to be after what God wants. How can I please him? The last thing I think the Lord taught me was this. I am persuaded that his grace can enable me to be, the, be, to be kind and long-suffering under all changes and circumstances. I believe I can be flexible. I believe that there's grace not only to save me, grace to keep me, and grace that will enable me to be able to handle anything that comes my way. Is that not what Paul said in Philippians? When Paul said, I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me? Now that didn't mean that he could go out here and throw a football better than Tom Brady. You know, that ain't going to happen. That ain't going to happen. I, I'm not, God can help me. You know, I, I appreciate these athletes that are uh, believers and, and they're always, if they have a good game and they've pitched almost a no-hitter or something, they'll say, well, the Bible said I can do all things through Jesus. And the next game they get knocked out in the first inning. So I don't know what happened to Jesus in that next game, but I'm just saying, that's not what Paul, Paul's not saying, I can go out here and make a million dollars. I can go out here and be a multimillionaire. I can do this and build it. No, 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 that's not what he's saying. Because here's what he's actually said. I know what it is to have a lot. I know what it is to have a little. I know what it's like to have an abundance. I know what it's like to be in need, but I can handle life because I have grace. The grace of the Lord that saved me is the grace of the Lord that keeps me. And no matter what comes my way, I can handle it. Praise God forevermore. I can handle it, not in myself, but through Jesus Christ who lives in me, I can handle whatever's going on in my life. You feel like things are against you right now? Feel like your heart's a little heavy? Feel like things are not going well financially? Maybe things aren't going good with you physically? Maybe you've got laid off from your work? I'm sorry about that. I don't, all I know is, the Bible tells me that his grace is sufficient and I can handle anything that comes my way. I stand on that. I live my life on that. By the way, how important is this that we learn how to live our life with stability? Well, first of all, if we can learn to do this, our own personal lives will be more fulfilling. We'll be able to get up every day and feel like I've got a purpose for this day. I've got a lot to be thankful for. I'm a blessed man. Things are going good in my life. You know, I can find something good for that day. You know, my life will be better. 
But even more important than that, if we learn how to be uh, stable, even in the down times, we're going to have some kind of an effect on other people that might be going through some unpleasant things. I hope you'll forgive me for using my wife for an example, but they wanted to, they thought maybe if they'd give Sandra some chemo treatments, it might do something to get her white corpuscles uh, uh, to, to drop and uh, to get to where she could have that bone marrow transplant. So she agreed to have some of these, and I would take her for these treatments. She'd take a series of uh, five and then have two weeks off, I think it was, and then have five more for five days and two weeks off. Anyway, now here's my wife going up there. I already got the, the word about how serious her case was. She would get those treatments. She became friends with the nurses that was given the treatments. She'd end up praying for them over something that was going on in their life. There were other people there in that room that was taking cancer treatments too. And she ended up finding out their name. She'd end up be praying for them. Some of those would be scared. They'd be afraid. They would just, they didn't know anything about the Lord. I have no idea how many people the Lord led to the Lord, uh, Sandra led to the Lord while she was going through these treatments. It was the nurses she met, the people that she met, because they had problems too. Not as serious as hers. But she wanted to have something that showed that she had something inside that wasn't just her, but it was the Lord. It was the life of the Lord Jesus. And I can't tell you how many people that I know that I've received cards from the doctors and people that treated her and took care of her because of her attitude. Because even though she was going through a bad time, she wanted to make sure she would use this time to help someone else. Friend? you're going through a bad time why don't you go encourage somebody well but brother I, you know, I always I always had an old aunt back home in Kansas that's what she'd do and during testimony meeting oh god I, 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 I don't hope I get to come back sometime maybe they might not want me but when I was a kid growing up I got to tell you this when I was a kid growing up you, at my home church I Hated Wednesday nights. Hated Wednesday nights. Because that was testimony night. And at my little old home church, they'd get somebody up there to lead what they called testimony. And they'd say, does anybody have a word for Jesus? Nobody would say much. And finally, now you got to remember, I'm from a relation church. 95% of the people in that building are blood relation. Aunts, uncles, cousins. I mean, we're, that's it. I had this one old great aunt, Aunt Effie. Every Wednesday night, it was the same thing. She'd get up and she'd say, well, and her little, her little chin would droop and she'd say, you all know that I'm a widow. You think? <laughs> hey, we was all there when they buried Uncle John. For month. Come on, man. Yeah, we know you're a widow. <laughs> well, and you know, I live by myself. Nobody comes to visit. That means the preacher don't come by, so she got to get a jab at him, <laughs> you know. And, and so, and then she'd say things like this. But... You know, Jesus is with me. <laughs> and she said, since the day I've got saved, I haven't even thought about sin. <laughs> well, see, I was sitting back there in the back and I was, I was about 15 years old and trust me, I'd been thinking. The thought of sin had crossed my mind. I haven't even thought about the world. So, 
So anyway, <laughs> but I'm saved and sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. That was it. Every Wednesday night, same thing. Now, how much effect did that have on my life? Not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. But I tell you who did have effect on my life was my old grandma. My grandmother had nine children. Four of them died. One died at birth. One died when he was two years old with something they called diphtheria back in those days. She had two burned to death in a hayloft. I never heard my grandmother complain. Never heard my grandmother say, Ty, life's been tough. My grandmother was not talented. Now, some of you people have little old gray-headed grandmas. Well, my grandmother was gray-headed, but she just wasn't little. My grandmother was six foot one. She was a big lady, big Dutch lady. And, I, and my grandmother was not talented. She couldn't sing. She never taught a Sunday school class, nothing. But my grandma would sing around that house. And I can remember my grandmother singing one song. Never heard her sing any other song. And she would sing, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust him more. And she would always sing this verse that said, I'm so glad I learned to trust him. Precious Jesus, Savior friend. And I know that thou art with me. And you'll be with me to the end. I remember that. That song my wife and I sang to our children when they were babies. And that's how we put them to sleep at nighttime. When my daughters had children, that's how they put their kids to sleep at night. And now my four great-grandkids are put to sleep with that same song at nighttime. That's the lullaby that is sang in their bedrooms when they go to bed. Why? I want to instill in them as young as I, as, as young as I can in their life to where they know life's not going to always be good. But I can trust this God. And I can handle life through Jesus Christ. Amen? Stand with me, please. If you believe it, say amen. amen. Oh, praise God. Amen. I feel his presence in this house. I hope I shared something this morning that's encouraged your heart. I don't know what you might be going through. I certainly don't make light of anything somebody might go through. But I just know that sometimes tough times do come. But I can handle them victoriously on this planet right now. I just don't want some unbeliever out there to be excited, more excited about life than I am. Yeah. You know, I really don't. I don't want somebody that, that, that's, that's old as I am happier about life than I am. Jesus is our Lord. Amen? I don't know why, but I just feel like if you feel like you'd like to come and pray, you don't have to, but let's come and gather around the front. As many as want to, please come and let's gather around the front. I promise you, I'm not going to interrogate you. I'm not going to ask you what you're going through. But I'd just like for us to come up around the front. And I love for the people of God to join together. God bless you. Man, I tell you what, she still looks like a kid. <laughs> I've known her for 20 years and she still looks like a kid. My oh, Lord, don't you people get old up here? <laughs> My Lord. Man. Wonderful people. Great people. <laughs> oh, blessed Jesus. I think I remember 
all of you. I said, remember your faces, several of you, wonderful people. Just go ahead, just lead us in whatever you feel. If you feel something special in your heart, you go ahead and do it, young man. Ah. God, you're in this house. You're with your people around this altar. God, I'm asking just let an encouraging spirit take place. Anybody that's going through a trial, something's a little heavy on their hearts, I'm asking you, God, to lift that heaviness today. Lift that heaviness. If there's some folks here, Lord, that just really might be going through a tough time, Lord, I'm asking you to do something special for them today. If it's a healing, if it's a job, if it's something in the home that they need prayer with, God, we just stand in your presence. And we're asking for fresh anointing. We're asking for fresh grace. We're asking you, God, to place within us a spirit of, of, of thanksgiving and gladness. May that, that, may that uh, time of weeping be turned into dancing. What a God you are. 